What are the elements that make military aviation artwork great? Well, to answer that question, I've asked fellow former Tomcat Rio, Dave Hajo Parsons, to join us again. You guys remember Dave from the Flight Jacket episode a few months ago. Dave was the editor of Approach before me, and on his watch as editor, he created a roster of varsity aviation artists who contributed to the magazine. And in the process, he developed a keen sense of what makes aviation art good or bad. So let's talk to Hajo. A lot of it translates over from photography. You got to have good composition and good light. And what I find with a lot of the artists that you and I both share a heritage of being magazine editors, that when you look at the art, it, it's got to be realistic. Um, the classic faux pas in the Tomcat is they'll take a photograph of a Tomcat and try to translate that into a painting. There's a real famous one out there. And the Tomcat puts its wings in oversweep, as you know, on the carrier deck. And this guy's painted a beautiful painting, but the airplanes are in oversweep, which is impossible to fly. Yet he's got it flying a low level with the wings in oversweep. And anybody that knows the Tomcat can see the wing and instantly know, hey, those wings are in oversweep. The unlearned get wrapped around the axle about technical detail at the expense of the overall impact of the work of art. They can have the rivet number right or every little latch and so forth and so on, but the end product is generally too static. What I consider one of the granddaddies of artists is Frank Wooten, who um, really made a name during um, World War II. And he was a landscape painter. So I got to meet him once with Adolf Galan and Robert Stanford Tuck at Air and Space Museum. And he said, yeah, all I did was paint landscapes and then drop airplanes into it. So you wouldn't be able to count the rivets on his airplanes, but boy, they were beautiful. I've got one hanging on my wall right now, and it's just gorgeous. Robert Taylor is right up there with him. He's a little younger, but his paintings are more marvelous paintings of sunsets and clouds and, you know, just depicting the environment with an airplane in it. And the light is just perfect. And that's where a lot of, the, I think, a lot of artists don't quite get it. They're either too hyper-realistic or um, don't really appreciate, no, an airplane really can't do that or wouldn't be in that. You know, especially with naval aviation, they, they've got the airplanes in wrong positioning around the carrier. Well, I'll mention one other artist that really uh, went to the nth degree. Um, and Keith Ferris actually is such a perfectionist that, he doesn't buy paint, you know, the different colors at the uh, art store. He mixes them from primary colors. He mixes all his colors. So he gets this really nice, almost buttery look to his paintings. And he's the one that Air and Space chose to paint the huge mural in the, the original Air and Space Museum on the mall of the B-17s in formation. And he takes every airplane and does a technique that was developed for architecture to take 2D drawings and then uh, translate them into a 3D perspective. And it's very detailed, but I had taken some architecture, just dabbled it in school to see if I was interested. So I had learned that and I was fascinated because it's very painstaking, but that's what he does. And that's why his airplanes look so um, incredibly accurate in the right perspective, because he goes through all that trouble to make that happen. So another interesting note about Keith Ferris that has tactical significance is the Heater Ferris paint job. Oh yeah. yeah. So he partnered with Heater Heatley. Heater had done that when he was in Phantoms and uh, approached Ferris and they came up with what they thought was a sort of a, um, a dazzle type paint scheme um, that would confuse you to the aspect of the aircraft and painting the cockpit on the bottom of the airplane. So if he, uh, broke away from you, you might really think he's turning into you. So that's kind of amazing for an artist um, to have that kind of tactical uh, impact. And that's obviously a function of Heater Heatley, who we will note wrote The Cutting Edge. He, like you, is a photojournalist. He's a prominent extra in the original Top Gun. You can see him throughout the movie at various times, including the Top Gun graduation scene. He says, we're talking about art. Let me take a sec to advise you about how you can make money by investing in it. As a retired naval officer, I've always gravitated towards defense industry stocks, which have done well lately, but they're still subject to market trends. This year, nearly every top equity firm is projecting returns of 5% or less, 
which is why an overwhelming majority of wealth managers are advising clients to diversify their portfolios immediately. So where can you invest that isn't overly leveraged against the market's reaction to world events? Well, contemporary art prices outpaced the S&P 500's total return by 164% from 1995 to 2020, and that's why two-thirds of billionaire collectors invest between 10 and 30% of their financial portfolios in art. At this point, I can hear you saying, cool stats, Ward, but I'm not a billionaire. I got that, but why not invest like one? Masterworks is the only platform that allows you to access collectors' investments in artwork by names like Banksy, Warhol, Basquiat, and other iconic artists for just a fraction of what the billionaire collectors paid to purchase. Getting started with Masterworks is easy. Just visit their website, create an account, and browse their artwork. And in no time, you've diversified your portfolio with one of the most stable assets around. You know, like the billionaires already have. Now, normally, if you want to take advantage of what I'm talking about, there's a wait list. But you can skip the wait list and immediately start investing in some fine art by clicking on my exclusive link in the episode description below. So check it out. So let's talk about some of our favorites and why. Thank you. We've already mentioned Keith Ferris and Frank Wooten and Robert Taylor. But also up there is William S. Phillips. He can tackle any airplane in any environment in any kind of lighting and just pull it off like you're really, I mean, it's the painting you want on your wall. The first one ever used on approach is I worked with his publisher, Greenwich, and got permission to use his, it's called Those Last Critical Moments. And it was a Tomcat landing aboard an aircraft carrier. And uh, it wrapped around and that was a big hit. And so I ended up talking to him personally about it. And ended up, it was a great relationship because by putting it on the magazine, everybody became aware of it and it sold out the entire press run. And uh, they started giving me access to other artists. So I came acquainted with Craig Cadera, who, um, Bill Phillips has gotten to fly because he's done so much for the Air Force and the Navy. So he appreciates it. He understands it from having flown. But Craig Cadera, who I'm looking at one of his right here of um, Pappy Boynton and his Corsairs uh, descending in the in the dawn light. And he's captured it perfectly. But he's an airline pilot. He had uh, I think he actually started in the Air Force, but he he's flies a lot, looks at clouds from above him and he knows how to capture them. And his his paintings, like the one of um, the uh, PBY looking for the Japanese fleet out of Midway, one of the strawberries, uh, as they called them, is is just amazing. And it just shows this lone Catalina out there searching for uh, Naguma and the fleet just prior to Midway. And that that launched the whole whole encounter. So I love Bill Phillips and I was introduced to him with the painting that you used on the cover. And it has all of the dynamic of carrier aviation on deployment. There's beauty, there's solitude. So what he conjures up is the mood that's accurate. One of my favorite ones I have of Bill Phillips is of the red tails over uh, Europe. And it's sort of in the late uh, light of day with um, he's really captured the, uh, the fields below the farmers uh, fields over France and it's a red tailed Mustang shooting down a Messerschmitt. It just pops out at you. And then there's also Craig Cadera who you, he's capturing the moment. Like you think you're really there and his have a little more immediacy. Um, and he, he gets all the airplanes right. And both those guys do. The other thing that bugs me in terms of, the good art and then everybody else is some artists are lazy in that they blur the ground to give the image of speed. And I, I think that's just lazy, you know, right. the other thing you see, and this is the realistic part because there's the famous Tomcat painting of it flying very low over the water and it's kicking up a wake, which is kind of a Frank Frazetta thing you would expect to see this on the side of a van right know? so I, I appreciate the you know over the top elements of that one but it doesn't speak to me as a tomcat guy yeah. you know i do not own that painting i yeah. don't want that right painting. exactly right so people see it, they're like it's very dramatic and i'm like yeah it's very fake and in terms of good artwork the other guy that comes to mind for me is somebody who we've both worked with 
uh, at Approach Magazine is Ted Wilbur. So let's talk a little bit about Ted's body of work and his style. Well, I first um, got offered the position at Approach. I asked, um, I noticed they had a bunch of the old issues there. And so in my six months after I accepted the position and uh, the six months before I actually showed up, I was borrowing the different volumes and reading Approach from its start in the 50s up till that current time, which was 1986. And I was really struck by these powerful black and white drawings that, I mean, immensely powerful, um, that illustrated because the magazine was not color, it was black and white. I realized they were all Ted Wilbur. So I started researching him and they said, yeah, he was a, actually a pilot that was assigned to the magazine, but he was heavily influenced, oddly enough, by Mad Magazine, which was really cutting edge in those days. So you can see the kind of influence in there. And all his paintings are so real and just so full of just immediacy. You know, he's got another one we used on the cover where he's he's looking down at a pilot about to pull a handle um, to eject. And it's, he's got everything right, everything. That was your first ejection theme issue, I think, right? Yes, it was. For me, the best ever is R.G. Smith, who I got to meet. I actually met him at the 1990 Tailhook Convention. He was hosted by the Naval Institute. His composition, his aesthetic is without peer to my eye. Um, so let's talk a little bit about where R.G. came from, who he worked for, and his body of work. What's interesting about him is he came from being an aviation, well, basically an aerospace engineer at Douglas. And he worked with the, the legendary Ed Heineman, who designed some of the most classic uh, airplanes ever, the A-4 Skyhawk, and even before that, the SBD Dauntless that was so effective in the Battle of Midway. Those were all Ed Hounderman designs, just like the uh, F-4D Sky Ray, just amazing airplanes. And they needed pictures of them. And um, R.G. Smith was belonged to a weekend, like he called it a watercolor group that would meet and they would paint. And he didn't know anything, but he learned from these other uh, watercolor landscape artists how to dry clouds, he told me. And um, I met him in 1986 in my first time at Tailhook. Every night there'd be a gathering of um, everybody in the publication staying in a suite hosted by Bob Lawson, the late Bob Lawson. And so you'd have artists in there, you'd have writers in there, you'd have editors in there, and they'd all talk about collaborating on projects. And I was fascinated by R.G. Smith and I got to know him. And I always looked for him when I was on the road. And he was an engineer, almost like um, we'll give honorable mention to Hank Caruso, who was also an engineer that became more of an artist. He has a unique style of art. And we published him in Approach quite a bit, helped launch his career. But the uh, R.G. Smith really came from almost a Frank Wooten kind of school of learning how to paint the environment and paint clouds. And he said that was his biggest challenge. And he said the airplanes were easy once he learned how to do the clouds. I'm always super impressed at the scale of his paintings he's painted some really big ones his paintings of the midway encounter are just amazing it's like you were really there yeah that's what i was going to say pierce arrow you know operation pierce arrow that captures stockdale coming off target in an f8 also i was influenced by rg at a very young age because my dad who was a marine corps a4 pilot had that a4 on the waste cat on our wall, which is a, a black and white sketch of an A4 on cat four. And, you know, they have the, the, the steering bar and it's just the airplanes loaded for a mission and you see the steam and the grease and it just has that image. Another one that jumps out as I think about RG is a similar composition that he did with an F4 on the cat, you know? So his aesthetic for me is perfect in terms of what artist captures all of the elements of military aviation and, and specifically carrier aviation. And I feel very lucky 
to have met him in person because that guy is a legend. He is very humble man too. Very humble. So who else would be in our honorable mention category here? Well, I'm, I would like to mention uh, James Dietz, who um, has unique ability to capture the human in his paintings. And he has a real, probably the widest waterfront of art because he'll tackle the, uh, a German aerodrome in World War I with the, the Baron Richthofen meticulously researched. A lot of units contact him, including some of the high uh, first tier special operations units during like the Black Hawk Down episode. He's done a really, really cool painting of that. Uh, the two snipers that they, they put in that got the Medal of Honor that he worked with the, the actual people to, to get that one right. But he does aviation stuff as well, just airplanes. And he's just uh, another guy that's very productive. He turns out a lot of art and no two are the same. And uh, he's someone whose art adorns my wall. One other guy is Roy Grinnell, who also was honored down at Pensacola as Aviation Artist of the Year. I got to meet him down there because I was at that one too. And he has tackled every famous airplane, every famous ace. He's got an epic painting of the P-38s intercepting Yamamoto over the jungles north of Guadalcanal where they launched from. Just, he gets everything right. He gets the lighting right. He gets the aspect of the airplane. His style is really good. He's right up there with the other guys. So, hey, Joe, thank you for bringing your expertise to bear on this topic. You were the right man for the job, and we look forward to having you on the channel again soon. Yes, yeah, so look forward to it. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. If you're a first-time viewer, please ring the bell and become a subscriber so you don't miss anything. And in the meantime... I look forward to talking to you again soon.